so we've agreed that hell is is the orthodox position in theology. Pastor friend now has to give counsel to um, those who have died outside the faith. Um, yeah, where do you go from there? Yeah, and that's I think where it really um, we had were talking earlier. I think that even in churches where there's not a rejection outright of the doctrine of hell, there is a like a silence on it. And I think your question gets to it. Like, um, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing. I mean, it's easy to talk about it in kind of an abstract discussion, philosophically justify it, where does it come from, all of that. But then, um, you know, I did a funeral probably a year and a half ago for a good friend of mine whose brother, uh, whom he just really admired, looked up to, loved, uh, went to his grave as an atheist and died slow death of cancer and um, just all the way to the end, you know, rejected, rejected God. And so um, what do you, like, how do you navigate that? Both in terms of like, how, what do you say at the funeral? You know, that's one question. And then there's the question of like, what do you, what do I say to my friend who, who still loves his brother? Like his, uh, he has affection for his brother, but now he knows that his brother has just slipped under the judgment of God. And uh, I think those are hard, that's a hard question. I guess maybe partly how I answer that is, um, uh, the, the question, that question really is an ultimate question, I think, is the question of theodicy. I mean, the, the doctrine of hell is the ultimate question of theodicy. Human suffering and the goodness of God, right? And hell is the ultimate question of that. And so for that, I, I, I think Job, the book of Job, offers some, some resources there for us. Because I think Job found himself in a situation where he didn't have a lot of information about what was going on. He didn't have the theological framework to really make sense of what was happening to him in his worldview, which I think is, in some ways, was the, the revealed worldview, how God had even laid it out himself, um, was, I bless righteousness and I bring judgment upon wickedness. Job is a righteous man, even by God's own statements. And so Job had every right to expect, as he had in the past, that his life would continue on in a blessed way. And then, and then wickedness befalls him, which he, he doesn't have a theological category for. You see that all throughout the discourse. His friends don't have a theological category for that, which is why they're giving him all sorts of bad advice. And so he doesn't have a theological way to make sense of the suffering that he's going through. And the resolution that comes for him in the end is God himself. Right, so God comes at the end, doesn't say, well, Job, let me explain to you the resurrection and I'm gonna like sort this all out and you know, God doesn't explain it. God just says, you got to believe that I'm God. I know what I'm doing. I'm bigger than you and submit yourself to that. and You're going to find peace. And um, I think that hell for us is like that ultimate theological vexing question that in the end, when it becomes very personal, when it's someone that I know, like I don't, I can't explain that theologically in a way that makes me go, oh, well, then it's, then it's okay. You know, now I feel good about it, right? So silence is inappropriate. I think silence, and I think that, um, that in the end, like, where we find peace when, it, when that knocks at our doorstep is God himself, right? That God himself is the answer. Not what God says, not our theology or rationalizing, which I think is all in, very important to try to make sense of it philosophically. But, but when it strikes home and it's personal, like to believe that, that, there's, that God himself has that figured out. And in the story of Job, I mean, the reality is that there was stuff that Job didn't understand that did make sense of his experience that we get privy to looking into it from the outside, but Job couldn't. And I, you know, and I would just say, I think like we reserve judgment on God, you know, when we don't understand, when hell doesn't make sense to us, rather than passing judgment upon God, we say, okay, maybe there's some things here that I don't fully understand. Maybe God hasn't even revealed all the stuff that needs to be revealed to make sense of it. And so I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna judge God for the decisions he makes. I'm gonna believe, because I've met him and I've seen him in Christ and I see his heart, I'm gonna believe that he knows what he's doing and so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna pass judgment. I think that's where you find peace at the end of the day. You don't, you don't find peace ultimately through the through all the talking and the rationalization. I think that's helpful, but not not where you ultimately find peace. In Psalm 19, there's a statement that the judgments of the Lord are true; they are righteous altogether. Yeah. Uh, so that's Psalm 19, and it's echoed in Revelation 19 because the saints in heaven, on seeing what God has done and bringing judgment on Babylon, which represents His power of wickedness, it's oppressing 
uh, God's people. They cry out and they said, True and righteous are your judgments, O Lord. Now that's the judgment of the righteous in heaven. Yeah. They are looking down, so to speak, from a very great height, God's seeing eye yeah. God's eye view, yeah, looking down from heaven. The problem is that we're on the ground. Right. Jonathan Edwards had a fascinating analogy for this. He, he compared it to the, he talked about a river of divine providence. And if you're on the ground, there are various tributaries of the river. And we have the idea that the tributaries all flow together, ultimately, and then they empty into the ocean. But on the ground, we might actually see, if we're looking at the Mississippi River Basin, that some of these tributaries seem to be going the wrong way. We may know that the Gulf of Mexico is south of here, but the tributary may be going north. And Edwards points out that if you were way up in the air looking down, you could actually trace every tributary and realize that not one drop of water fails to come into the ocean, which represents God's final purpose. But we don't have the capacity to, to fit it all together. So there is ultimately an appeal to, to, to faith in, in, in God and His plan. Yeah, and I think like, like as a discipleship moment, as it were, hell is the one doctrine right now, perhaps more than any other doctrine out there, that challenges us to trust God's judgment over our own, right? And maybe that wasn't true 200 years ago. Um, Keller in, in his book, The Reason for God, makes the point that in past ages and in other cultures, the doctrine of hell isn't an offensive doctrine. People would be offended if you denied the doctrine of hell, right? But in our culture, the doctrine of hell is a stumbling block. And I think it's the one doctrine that forces us to say, I'm not God, he's God. And when you remove the doctrine of hell, you remove that, you remove that discipleship moment. And we say like, we think we know better than God. And uh, I think that that has repercussions then, not just on the doctrine of hell, but, but across the board in how I live my life. Hell forces us to come to grips that we're with the fact that we're not God.